afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for sticking around which, for what is going to be clearly the best talk of the day. Um, and so obviously we're here to talk about Revolut and what a global bank really looks like. Uh, Nikolai, I'm sure everybody here will know you, but just for the small number of people in the audience who may not, can you just yeah. explain for us what Revolut is? So basically we provide the digital banking alternative both for consumers and uh, businesses. We allow people to open uh, effective bank accounts now in 28 countries, uh, allow them to do free money transfers, free currency exchange, uh, the best possible credit, buy, sell cryptocurrencies at best possible price, buy, sell insurance, and so on. So we provide uh, your everyday financial products that you need, just one simple app. And we have more than 2 million customers now. And uh, Tom, obviously, uh, you guys at DST are investors in Revolut. Uh, 2 million customers in three years, is that what drew you to the company? I mean, that, that's, that's nice, but no. <laughs> what, 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 uh, what drew us to the company really is, is, is Nick and the team. Uh, so uh, fundamentally, when we're thinking about investing, we really have three things we're looking for. Um, and the first and most important is, is team and founder. Uh, we only back founder-led companies, and we only back companies where we think the founder has the vision and the ability to, to build something very, very large. And so, so first and foremost is Nick. And then, of course, we're also looking for companies that are disrupting and, and building in large categories. I mean, roughly speaking, financial services has about 16 or 17 trillion US dollars of market cap today, uh, which you know, should move across to internet companies pretty rapidly. And, and thirdly, we're looking for category leaders. And I guess there, the two million customers in, 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 in three years is a moniker of leadership. But the most important thing is, is it's uh, two million uh, users in three years without a single dollar of marketing. And that means Nick and the team have built something attractive to the user because they're coming free for free. Nicola, what, what is your secret then? How have you ach achieved this phenomenal growth? Uh, working very hard. <laughs> <laughs> is that all? Just uh, and smart. Smart. And how do you work smart? How, how do you do that? Uh, well, I don't know. You just f always find the best possible solution to your problem, right? And then you don't settle down <laughs> until you find it. It sounds easy when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, you are across 28 countries, as you said. Um, how do you go about having a sort of global outlook from day one when the majority of your staff are in London? Yeah. So we try to centralize as much as possible, right? So uh, majority of tech, uh, majority of compliance, majority of operations have been, been run from London, right? And then as, as we go into a new country, there is always kind of, kind of process behind what we need to do. So we need to set up infrastructure, which has been done by launches. Then we need to effectively start growth, which, which is done by uh, growth launches. And then as, as business grows, we, we put you know, more and more team on the ground. So there is kind of a you know, process which is already, uh, I would say, quite sleek and it works. And we're just uh, repeating it again and again and again. And uh, how do you approach something like uh, regulation, which uh, obviously is by its nature local? Again, there is a process, right? So uh, we have uh, built in house the whole set of policies, procedures, how we operate, right? And then every time when we go into the new country, again, there is a process how we investigate uh, local regulation, right? whether our systems and process fits it, and then if, 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 if something doesn't fit, we actually tweak it a bit on a local level. But uh, generally, we try to be uh, uh, as simple as possible and as unified as possible. And uh, I was interested to read uh, your recent comments to uh, CNBC where you were talking about the fact that you expect uh, your challenges in the future not to come from the traditional banks, but from the likes of Amazon or Apple. Um, wh what made you say that? I think they've got the best people, right? They still have uh, ambitions, right? They're still hungry for success compared to banks, which are run by board of directors and shareholders, not <laughs> founders, right? <laughs> so we should not, we, we should not hungry. Yeah. And Tom, is that something you think about when you're assessing companies like Revolut? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the fundamental belief that I hold is that um, uh, the best talent utilizing technology and internet will effectively take over uh, almost all industrial 
uh, verticals that exist today and the ones that will exist in the future. And by industrial verticals, I mean 100% of global GDP. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're a B2B widget manufacturer or a bank or a, a retailer or a media company, your biggest threat will come from smart people uh, with an engineering and product mindset building technology and products that, that build better products uh, first and foremost, but also better customer service, better loyalty, better follow-up, uh, uh, and will reinvest the economics they gain very aggressively in price. And so something that Nick didn't mention, for example, is that FX transactions on Revolut are free. I mean, what bank gives anything away for free, let alone FX, which is a huge profit generator? But if you think about that concept of free, reinvesting your economics into your customer, that's the watchword of internet. Think about what uh, uh, Amazon is doing with its media content. If you pay for other services, you get this for free. Uh, think about what uh, 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 Facebook did providing free connectivity uh, and monetizing with other means. And so this idea of free is something that the banks or manufacturing or other industries would just never be able to get their head around. And you mentioned uh, Amazon there. Obviously, we see a virtuous circle, as you say, where they reinvest in things that help their future growth. Meanwhile, for traditional retailers, they're stuck in a sort of death spiral where Amazon just is pecking away at them. Are we going to see something similar for traditional retail banks where the likes of Revolut come, uh, come along and uh, knock them on the head? I, I don't <laughs> know for sure, but I'm hoping so. <laughs> and Nikolai, what do you think? You, you used to work at a major investment bank, Credit Suisse. Yeah. Do you think the likes of them can keep up with uh, Revolut? Banks, uh, I, I just don't think so. To be honest, yeah, I've been there uh, too long, right, to, to understand that you know. Uh, I mean, the reality, if you stick in a bank for longer than ten years, I mean, you, you change as a person, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I would recommend to work there for more than ten years. And in reality, there are so many bankers who, who are already working in a bank for twenty years, twenty-five years, thirty years, and obviously, there, there, there will be no innovation coming from them. You may have some banks, in fairness, you may have some banks who at least attempt to change. I mean, you're seeing this in the retail world with Walmart. Mm. I mean, making very aggressive steps mm. to at least trying to change. Some of that is acquired through Jet.com and Flipkart and other transactions, but at least they're trying to change. But the vast majority of retailers haven't managed to change and they are dying. Toys R Us, the pet chains, the, the pet food chains, etc. So, so there'll be one or two who may make the transition, but Majority of them won't. And then banks are also trying to kind of you know change in their own unique way. They go on meetings even more often about you know digital innovation. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's my view. And do the banks do they call you up? Are they looking for meetings with the uh, yeah for, for meetings with me as well? But I'm all saying I'm sorry I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously one of the hot topics at the moment is. Um, Cryptocurrency, I know you guys launched a sort of cryptocurrency trading product last year. Uh, how significant has that been in uh, helping spur your growth? Well, our, our, our view, right, we give customers what they want. Right now, there was a huge demand for cryptocurrencies, right, so we released it. Uh, it was quite successful. I think overall, 10% um, of our customers, they use our crypto product or still using crypto product. Uh, I think... Uh, Later, we actually announced that we will we'll give our customers the ability to load cryptocurrency, uh, to actually receive interest on cryptocurrency as well. Um, so there are, there are a few few cool things that are coming up. And uh, unlike uh, other sort of challenger banks such as N26 or Monzo, you guys haven't gone down the route of going for a banking license immediately. I know you're in the process for the, uh, applying for one at the moment. Uh, w why did you choose that path? And uh, do you think having a banking license slows you down in some respects? Well, for first question, we didn't go for, for, for banking license because uh, there was no need for it. We didn't have credit business mm. at that moment of time, right? And we decided to go into credit, you know, much deeper. Uh, then we decided to, to go for banking license to, to be able to unlock client money and lend client money, right? And then uh, your second question was uh, why... Uh, Do you think it slows yeah. you down? Having slows that you down. Uh, I think it's actually as value, right? Because uh, when we started working on the uh, banking license, 
uh, I had to read a lot of regulation, <laughs> CID4, and then all these kind of you know, governance principles that I have no clue about. And actually, they're very wise uh, in terms of you know how you run the company, how it should be governed, how it should be controlled, right? And uh, I think it really adds value to our company to implement it. Mm. So you think it's the right strategic uh, move long term? I mean, at least for now, what I see, like it adds value to your credit business, it adds value to your governance. And uh, you guys have announced plans to launch in the US uh, imminently. Uh, I, I was speaking to somebody uh, earlier in the conference from the US who was saying, uh, unlike Europe, where there's a lot of uh, cross-border travel and need for that sort of currency um, FX product, yeah. a lot of people in the US travel domestically. I, are, are you going to rethink your expansion strategy when you go over there? I mean, in reality, we are not a FX company anymore, right? Not travel product anymore. We are, I would say, in full stack, full stack banking, even beyond, right? And that's what we're going to raise in the US, right? So we will not position ourselves as a travel product, right? Position ourselves as a modern digital bank and beyond, which is global, right? Which allows people to uh, open an account in a few seconds, well, in a few minutes, right? And then send money anywhere in the world, uh, use card, avoid commissions, uh, ATM fees, um, borrow money, buy cryptocurrency, buy insurance, and so on. On that sort of point, uh, a, a few years ago, the sort of major trend in financial technology was the sort of unbundling of banks where transfer-wise, companies like that did one vertical very, very well. Tom, we were speaking earlier about how you think the trend is actually now going towards the rebundling of banks. Well, well it's less that the trend is now going towards rebundling. I just never actually believed in the unbundling concept in the first place. I, I think there's certain quite specific transactions you may want to take out of the bank, uh, you know, certain very large loan types, certain very large insurance products, etc. But I always think about it from the, the user's point of view, from the consumer or the SME or the enterprise's point of view. And if you think about their point of view from daily banking, they don't want to have 18 different apps. Uh, they want to have one app or one service that provides their daily banking needs. They just don't want to do it at a branch center they have to queue up for or they don't want to be in a call center queue for 45 minutes where the operator doesn't even know who they are and to re-authenticate re all the time. They want a Deliveroo-like service, so app-like service, internet-like service, but they want it for their daily banking. And so this concept that your FX would be over here in one app and you'd have a debit card for your app over here, your insurance would be in a different app and your money transfers would be over here and your P2P payments over here, I mean, why would you have different apps for that? I don't want to have that many apps. What I really want as a consumer is I want all of that stuff to be abstracted away from me. I just want things to occur, like when I press a button that the burger arrives. <laughs> and the only thing I want to do is when the burger's cold, I complain. If the burger's fine, I don't. Um, and that's how I see banking going forward. And so that's not unbundling of banks, that's just digitizing banks. And uh, t taking that cold burger metaphor, I mean, how important do you think is this sort of... Uh, modern customer service in app chatbot to winning over this new generation of customer that is used to talking to Deliveroo, talking to Netflix through these sort of interfaces? I mean, in my view, uh, best customer service is uh, when you don't need customer service. <laughs> <laughs> so in reality, the, the way we operate, yes, uh, we've got a product, right? Uh, obviously, it's good, right? But it's not perfect, right? And sometimes, uh, things happening uh, which are corner cases, right, which we didn't expect to happen, right, and that's why people has to have, have to go to customer support. But with time, the, the whole point of digitalization, right, means that, you know, everything is automated, everything is streamlined, everything is perfect, and you don't need to have customer support. What's the point to waste time, like, you know, speaking with someone, right? You just need the uh, things to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose that we can all dream that, that that'll uh, one day I be mean, the... dreams <laughs> they used to happen, right? And uh, <laughs> you guys are obviously a, a unicorn now, and you've raised $250 million, huge amounts of money. Um, as you scale, how do you make sure that the company culture that has made you so successful thus far remains intact? Uh, well, high turnover with people who don't suit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you're pretty brutal. Uh, well, I would say it's, 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 I would say it's a very important uh, ingredient for success, right? To have a very strong team and very strong people. 
right? Because as, as you grow, right, uh, unfortunately, uh, your interview process is not, uh, I would say, like, you know, precise enough, right? And it's, it's a probability, right? Probability of, you know, picking the right people, right? And as you grow, the visibility in the company becomes, you know, much less. So it's super important to, to still have, you know, a very high level of visibility to, to be able to identify, you know, great, great talent. And then we can continue going with the same speed. And how do you find uh, the talent question? Is, is talent still good in London or has Brexit affected it at all? Well, we haven't seen it so far, to be honest with you. I mean, nothing at all. There were you know, so, so many talks about like, okay, startups are going to die. But you know, we, we are still there. Yeah. So no, we're still hiring like, I don't know, 40 people a month. 40 yeah. people a month. So yeah. hand your CVs in at the end. And uh, No uh, paper. No. <laughs> true, true. Email, email. Or chatbot, maybe chatbot. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But just to close the panel, um, Nikolai, you are launching so many products uh, at Revolut, it's hard to keep track of. But what are the things you've got in the pipeline and what are the technologies that you're most excited about? Well, me personally, I'm very excited about our uh, investment product, right? And uh, the, the way I see uh, future generation investment product allows you to effectively invest, buy and sell almost any asset class, right? Stocks, bonds, ETFs, put money instantly into kind of, you know, robo-advisor as well, all in one app, showing you your, your historical return plus your projected return. That's what we're working at the moment. So uh, in the next uh, uh, several weeks, we are going to launch uh, robo-advisory and then uh, commission-free trading just in uh, one simple, slick app. And Tom, uh, a more high-level view, what, what are your views on the most exciting technologies that are going to touch banking over the next couple of years? I wouldn't really comment too much on the, like the underlying technologies, which, again, I think if, if what we really care about is the, end, the experience of the end user, then what we're really looking for, uh, or what will drive the future, is, is great uh, founders and great teams building great products. The most important thing I always think is that pe people get too obsessed with what the technology backbone is. You know, what role is, blo is blockchain going to play, et cetera. Like, ultimately, big companies get built when large number of users want to use your service over and over and over and over again. A and that's what Revolut is building. They're not building a particular piece of technology or a particular product. They're building a service for all SMEs, all consumers, everywhere in the world to do their daily banking. And that's pretty exciting. It's not a product, it's not a little piece of technology, it's a full banking service. And that's all the consumer needs to know, that's all the SME needs to know. They don't need to worry about what's in the back end. Well, unfortunately we're out of time, but uh, I hope you'll all join me in thanking our panel and uh, thank you very much.